Can you hear me now? Oh, I have sound. I have sound. Check. Mic check. Mic check. One, two, one, two. Someone give me the thumbs up. It seems like I have it now. I, I feel like I do. I'm seeing the meter moving up and down now. Let me check my other thing. Other things seems to be going. Okay, good. <laughs> well, let me start over then. Happy Tuesday. Happy Gung Hei Fat Choi. Happy Lunar New Year. We are continuing going through the original known world docks. We were midway through the alignments. And as I was saying, when none nothing, thank you, none nothing, let me know that I, nobody could hear me. That I really, I really like these a lot. I, I think it's really cool. And I will probably do something with this, maybe genericize it a bit. I'm not, not, not in the supplement sense, but for a video, because I think that this could be an interesting way to look at alignments. If you don't like the, uh, if you're not satisfied with the kind of nine pointed alignment or even the way the three, three prong alignment goes, this might be, I mean, obviously you have a, a, a different, this is, I don't know what we would call it. So I guess there are six, 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 and six. So the kind of 18, 18 prong alignment in a way, but I appreciate some of the things it does, the way it's divvied up, neutral law and chaos the way it's given pretty good i mean clears can be with things that are ultimately philosophical spiritual but you you really get a good sense of what each one of these different aspects or segments is like i like that it's tied in with deities i just think it's a really it's a kind of a cool alternate system i don't know if any other any other products use a kind of similar system i don't think i've seen this before i just thought it was really cool So I, I think because, and, and I guess I say do something, a separate video, only because I think a lot of times folks don't catch the streams. I know they, they come up there long. They, and uh, they, uh, you, you don't really get a hold of what's inside it. You know, it just says, hey, we're going part four through the, through the docks. So I think sometimes some really good stuff gets lost. And while, while I could just kind of cut it out of the different videos, it's probably better for me just to make, make something of some of these topics alone uh, so that I can kind of try to come up with something cogent to say about it. With that said, part four, we're back. All right, so we were, we had done, the last thing we had done was that last neutral aspect, which the, if we recall, it was originally this, this that as listed here, passism slash slash, Rejection of the physical. And at some point, it got uh, crossed out and replaced with war, but we don't have a write-up for war, at least yet. I do really like Fafra, whose armor class hit points are both irrelevant and, and under move. It just says, where? <laughs> with a question mark, which I love. Okay, on to chaos. The first aspect of chaos is high chaos, a.k.a. absolute randomness. The tenets are, the ideal is the coexistence of all possibilities, which will come about when the bonds of law and time, which is a lawful concept, are broken. The ultimate goal is a return to that condition of total randomness that supposedly existed before the imposition of law. I wonder why they say supposedly. You'd think if you were into this that you would believe it and would not need the supposedly. Hold on, I gotta do one thing. My second monitor, I kind of moved it, and I'm realizing now it is too far back. I can't really see it well, so I'm moving it back up. So let me riveting streaming as I'm moving stuff along on my desk. There we go. All right, now nothing says in second edition, I got a vibe similar to this alignment system for neutral. Sometimes neutral is balance, other times it's pro nature, other times it means no alignment, other times it means indifference. Yeah, this is definitely true. They, depending on uh, not just which edition you're playing, but just which, however your house rules, however your table rules, yeah, there tend to be these kind of varying ideas of what neutrality means. So one of the nice things about this setup is you kind of get all of those. You're not, you're not, you don't really have to pick and choose between one. You get, you get them all. So it's kind of like they, they're covering, covering all the bases, which I think is cool. Because usually, I feel like you get one of those in your game, like or, or or maybe on a player per player basis, or really a GM to GM basis. This is what neutral is in my game. But in this case, yeah, you got all the all the neutrals are there. The prime deity for absolute randomness is named Carnawen, 
A formless, sizeless, timeless mass. The sight of Karnawin drives mortals instantly mad. Fortunately, it is impossible for more than one of his tentacles to appear on the prime material plane, and that must take some kind of form, usually that of a human. This tentacle contains only 10% of Karnawin's hit, point, hit points, and its appearance is continually changing subtly. Its armor class also continually varies from 10 to minus 9. With this form, however, Karnawin can throw any possible spell. Karnawin more, more often works through his agents, which are usually Baldenders. I don't know what a Baldender is, but that's what he uses. He rewards, he rewards those who aid him by improving their attributes and by absorbing them into his substance upon their deaths. Well, that's just lovely. So what happens if you try to reincarnate? That would be an interesting... This is where I feel like there are these hooks for things that maybe they dealt with and just didn't make it in this document or it's elsewhere or this never came up. It just seems fascinating. What happens if you try to reincarnate a, a, a someone who's of that high chaos worshiper of Karnawin? If, if he's being absorbed into Karnawin itself... Would there be some chance that instead of the person coming back, you get one of those tentacles coming back or some weird tentacle individual hybrid? Some uh, nice space there to figure out some interesting things with these followers. Or maybe they wouldn't want to be reincarnated. I don't, I don't know. The next aspect of chaos is called personal power. And this one parenthetically refers to the assassins. We don't, I'm just checking out. No, there was no class for... No class called out in absolute randomness. So personal power has these tenets. The destruction of law offers the greatest of opportunities for a clever person to take advantage of. Chaos holds the promise that anyone can be great and powerful under the right conditions. The rigid forms of law offer no chance for the individual to get ahead. By fomenting disorder, an unscrupulous person can gain an, an in to the personal power he desires. Okay, this is interesting. Because I tend to think this seems to be the person, the kind of supervillain, not the one who's trying to be the mafia boss, which I would think is more lawful in terms of wanting to be an organization. But someone that just wants power for themselves and doesn't care anything about any, anybody else, isn't really interested in leading others, but in other forms of personal power. I, I would guess maybe a lich would qualify as this kind of uh, a chaotic alignment, potentially. No, nothing says AC 10 to minus 9. Very subtle change. <laughs> yeah, so that might just be... I mean, look, it's a god, right? So its outer appearance doesn't need to ch maybe change very much for it to get those armor classes. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, it slowly goes from wearing, you know, cloth to wearing the most magic of Admantine armor and back again, I suppose. Right, Smith asks, is it Eldritch? I mean, I suppose it could be. I mean, there's another one we ran into that also has felt very much like a Thuloid... Uh, power, but that one definitely with the idea of it forming people mad and only particular tentacles coming out, it definitely has a Cthulhu-esque vibe to it. I thought there was another one that kind of had that had a similar vibe, but yeah, I, I could definitely see that one being a sort of Cthulhu stand-in. I mean, anytime you're bringing in tentacles and madness, maybe it's just me, but I think, I think Cthulhu. So on the personal power front, the prime deity is Bliskuta. Bliskuta appears as a werebore the size of a frost giant fights with a huge granite club that strikes for 6 to 60 points of damage. He will aid supplicants only in return for large endowments of his temples or the blood price of the life of a lawful bureaucrat. His aid usually comes in the form of a temporary doubling of the strength, level, and or hit points of the beneficiary. In extremity, he may send 1 to 6 werebores or others of his servants to help. 5% chance. Bleskuta is careful to appear stupider and much less cunning than he is. He has been known to walk the earth in many different guises, Intriguing and fomenting discord. Generally, the more successful his worshippers are, the more he favors him. It's interesting how we have this connection with werebores. I don't know. Did we see werebores? Were they ones that they covered? I don't think they were one of the options, the player options. Are I, I, do boars have a uh, have a reputation for being just destructive and just interested in their own? I mean, I don't know. In an animal, just sort of feeding and doing its own thing, maybe. Maybe, I'm not sure, but it's a nice wrinkle. And I would definitely want to want to build that in if I had werebores in my game. I definitely want to make sure that they were, uh, you know, followers of Bliskuta. And then it would be cool if you had werebores show up. Was that Bliskuta influencing it? You know, who knows? Who could know? <laughs> 
Brian Smith says, oh, thanks, Muscuda. Six werebores showed up. la ti da Well, I, I, you know, I don't know how powerful they are. It maybe, maybe that's, uh, that's actually pretty good. I don't know. But yeah, that's in extremity. That's if you're super, you know, super in his favor and your need is great, maybe you get one to six. You might just get a, a wild boar normal and it just gores you, you know, or just it gores everybody. Now we're at the war aspect of chaos. Remember, there is a war aspect of law, which we covered in the last stream, and there is a so far non-explored war aspect of neutrality. This is chaos, and here are its tenets. War's most inherently chaotic action humans could undertake. The most inherently chaotic action. Conflict is to be encouraged, not only against law, a prime consideration, but for its own sake. A good all-out war may disrupt things so much that law may lose its grip on the world completely. So we're looking at, you know, war for war's sake. Not war as uh, cleansing the world, not war as some sort of... I don't even know what. I mean, I kind of think of that sort of, I guess cleansing is kind of all encompassing, whether it's taking out the weak or taking out people who don't agree with you, whatever. This is just, hey, we want war because war is good because the chaos that comes with war just in itself is good. The, the maelstrom, we want the storm. The prime deity for this is Thakta Tilden or Thakta Tilden, I'm not sure. This god appears as a huge warrior in black armor with red trim. In his presence, all chaotic warriors fight at plus four, all lawfuls at minus four. He wields the Whip of Chaos, which can strike up to three opponents at once for four to forty points of damage each. It is extremely rare for Thakta Tilden to appear personally in anything less than Armageddon-sized battles. He prefers to send one or more of his sons to fight for him. And here we have his sons Lakunth, which is a 15th level were-tiger, Pakunth, a stone giant, and Rakunth, an orcish demigod. Oh, there's also Kwakunth, a winged 10th level troll, and Dakunth, a 20th level Demi Balrog. Whew. Thakta Tilden may reward valuable service on his behalf with a mighty weapon or powerful destructive wand, 10% chance. On the other hand, cowardly followers may be turned into kobolds. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Don't, uh, don't, don't, don't go yellow in Thakta Tilden's presence. You just might end up a kobold. On to the next aspect of chaos, life slash fertility. Tenets. Life in its infinite variety is the true finest expression of chaos. Fertility and change are the watchwords. Law, as the imposition of order and stagnation, ultimately equals death. Such an end must be fought vigorously so that life will have a chance to explore all possible options. Well, that's kind of sweet in its own way. Primary deity for this is Temanamet. Temanamet. Tamanamat. <laughs> uh, I want to see like I keep wanting to say Tiamat, but that's clearly not Tiamat. Tamanamat appears as a full-breasted, wide-hipped woman carrying a cornucopia from which she can pull any form of life she desires, including creatures to fight for her once per round. With a few spells, she can cause the driest wasteland to become fruitful. Her cleric's healing spells are more effective than usual, 10% more so per level of cleric. She usually uses satires as her messengers. And agents, farmers, barren women, and sterile men are her most common supplicants. I mean, it makes sense if you need, if you desperately wish for fertility, you might do that. Become a supplicant for Temanemet. Was there a class given with this one? Nope, no class. Next, we have evil slash death. <laughs> and Brian Smith says... A Temanemat is his favorite god so far. She thick. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, she seems to be that kind of earth mother type, which is good. It'd be interesting because I wonder how, how you know, the, the uh, Thaka Tilden or Thakta Tilden would get along with Temanemat. I'm guessing not very well. I mean, even though I suppose in some ways war might be beneficial for clearing out space, at some point it becomes too much because what can grow in in a battlefield you know not not too much but it might be some inter interesting interactions there so the tenets of chaos or the evil slash death aspect of chaos are random wicked wickedness and cruelty is chaos's greatest weapon against law 
Seemingly pointless violence and atrocities can create more confusion and disruption of the social order than any other cause. Life, ultimately, must be completely eradicated. The only real difference between living and unliving matter is that living beings actively impose restrictions upon the stuff of chaos. A life is a product of law, and death is a returning of organized substance to disorganized chaos. Well, that's a super interesting way to look at it. Uh, I don't wonder why they put evil slash death. I guess because you're doing so doing pointless violence and atrocities, but I imagine they wouldn't think it was evil. I would almost just put just death. These, that, 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 and it's not even pointless violence and atrocities. It's almost like there are two different things going on in this one because I almost wonder if they should have been split because you have one which is an active, is you're doing the violence and atrocities to create con confusion and disruption that's kind of its thing. And by doing that, you are undermining law. And then on the other one, you have you have to eradicate life because living beings are products of, 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 of law and they need to be undone. I almost wonder if they could be kind of split because the second one doesn't really have much to do with being pointless. There actually is a point to the violence. And I imagine that just doing violence kind of randomly wouldn't be part of their routine. It would be more like a Thanos kind of thing, I imagine, where you try to would try to get the Chaos Gauntlet, or, or not Chaos Gauntlet, try to get the Infinity Infinity Gauntlet and snap your fingers and just d delete everybody. Like, that to me would be the ultimate goal of the death part. But that's not necessarily point going around doing pointless violence and atrocities along the way. It would be more, almost that more systematic, no, we're going to go world by world and just destroy every, kill everybody. So we're the only ones left and then presumably kill ourselves or live out whatever left is our lives, whatever, something of that nature. Whereas the other one is more how you undermine law is through violence, right? Violence is a tool of chaos because it undoes order. Maybe, I don't know, not sure. No, nothing says, I'm sure my game is no better for a new player, but these names are just a lot. <laughs> I think whenever you read a bunch of these new names, or any names, and you read them a lot in quick succession, they seem like a lot, they, you know, everything kind of, but I I feel like in a game, or once you get used to them, and, and they're, they're sort of in your actual game, they're not just, because I imagine, right, in this document, we're reading all this stuff really quickly, but it's often stuff that you're only going to be dealing with when they come up in the actual game world, and maybe when you're creating a character, and then you can kind of build it up more in the world. So I feel like in the actual game, it wouldn't be a big deal. But yeah, we're all coming from our own tables outside of everything. And now we're dumped into, you know, a hundred names or not. I mean, hundred, but you know, whatever, tens, tens of names. We don't know how they were pronounced. We're just trying to read them in our heads. So they may not sound the best to us. And we don't have the context. I mean, we're, we're, we're reading the context, what little context we have kind of right here. So yeah, it definitely seems kind of overwhelming. And I'm sure that's true. If you ever go to someone's game, sit down at their table and they hand you some book and say, okay, let me tell you about everything that's going on in this world. And then they're rattling off all this stuff and your head just starts to spin like, oh, okay, gotcha. And then Brian Smith says, ha ha, <laughs> trying to do the ha ha, read the ha ha text. Ha ha, Birdman. The names are always just extravagantly obtuse because fantasy. Right. Though, to be fair, maybe some of these wouldn't be obtuse. I mean, Galad, depending on what language you speak, it might not be. We saw other names had kind of Greek to them and whatnot. Um, yeah, definitely Tamananat or Tamanamat was one that does not roll off the tongue for me, but maybe for someone else it does. Galad or Golod or Golod. Galad's huge squat body has four arms that end in taloned hands. His face is flat and apish, with tusks protruding from his mouth. Tattooed on his chest is the yellow sign. Galad can only be appeased by human sacrifice. He will look most favor favorably upon those who have sent him the most lives. He fights with his four clawed hands, which hit for three to thirty points each, plus paralysis, save versus spells, his servants include the Legion of Undead, and he may send aid in that form if his followers are in need. 5% chance. Those who serve him in life can expect to serve him later as members of the Undead. Galad may, 5%, reward some particularly evil deed with the gift of some terrible artifact or weapon. Sounds a lot like Orcus, which is cool. Now we get to the Tenet of Devolution or De-Evolution. 
It is possible to return down the ladder of evolution to the primal oneness of the beginnings of life. Great truths are hidden in the primordial ooze from which we sprang. We must evolve in order to understand these ancient cosmic secrets. Degeneration is first mental and then physical. The first step in this sacred task is the sloughing off of humanity for the bestial and depraved. It may actually take many generations before the devolving ones can fully grasp the meaning of the hidden knowledge. But if they're devolving, how will they <laughs> grasp any meanings if they've, if they've lost all their mental acuity? Who's to say? And here we have definitely, this is straight out of something Cthulhu Cthuloid. A prime deity is Sog Morthoth. That's definitely Cthulhu-esque. I do like this phrase here. The first step in this sacred task is the sloughing off of humanity for the bestial and depraved. Boy, that's some, that's some nice language right there. Sog Morthoth appears as an amorphous creature about 40 feet in diameter, oozing greenish slime from its surface and sprouting tentacles and pseudopods apparently at random. It radiates a permanent fear spell in a 100-foot radius, which must be saved against each round. If its worshippers call upon it for aid, it may, 10% chance, help them by temporarily doubling their strength and or the effectiveness of their spells, 1-10 to 10 rounds duration. Those in Sog Morthoth's service tend to gradually become less human and more bestial, and begin to prefer subterranean living to the surface world. They may actually develop infravision. Do do do. Brian Smith says, adios, humanity. Yep. Pretty much. Oh, I guess this is the end. So we never got, we never got a, we never got the, uh, the aspect, the, the chaos, or no, sorry, the neutral aspect of war. We'll just have to imagine it. But now we get on lovely yellow legal paper, the history of Imerhos. The beginning of present history of the Imerhosian continent began with the breakup of the ancient Thang Empire. Twelve centuries ago, civil wars and barbarian invasions occurred constantly, and monsters roamed the countryside at will, and in their wake followed pestilence and famine. Dozens of petty rulers and their armies contested for power. Each faction was aided by its own high-level magic users who researched and used forbidden spells in an effort to gain an advantage for their side. The anarchy continued and finally culminated in the Battle of Ariton Vale, where the two largest allied coalitions struggled for the soon-to-be-meaningless title of Emperor of Thanagioth. So much magical power was unleashed during the battle that the earth itself protested. Terrible quakes shook the continent and the southern third split off from the rest. The new southern landmass was unstable, slowly sinking until it eventually stabilized as a series of archipelagos and islands. Civilization slowly stabilized in the aftermath of the cataclysm. City-states sprang up and slowly tamed the wilderness around them, which has been overrun, or which had been overrun by monsters and brigands. A brisk trade flourished between cities and peaceful times resulted. During the next several hundred years, intermittent struggles took place, alliances were formed and broken, and gradually the geopolitical structure of the continent developed as it stands today. The rulers learned the cataclysmic lesson and refrained from any all-out aggression. The Imerhosian continent, or Imerhosian maybe is a better word, the Imerhosian continent as it stands today, boasts several powerful entities. The Empire of Theatis controls one quarter of the continent and with a population of over 7 million inhabitants is twice as large as its nearest rival. The Republic of Darokin, population 3.6 million, is Theatis' chief rival. The kingdom of Sizani also bids for power. After the largest three powers, the others only attempt to maintain their independence and prosperity. Much of the wilderness has been tamed, yet much remains to be explored and pacified. An intrepid man or woman or group can go far in this age, for the opportunity is there, and such is the continent of Imerhos at present. Wow, that's like the end of the beginning of the end of the prologue. An intrepid man or woman or group can go far in this age, for the opportunity is there. And such is the continent of Imerhos at present. Bum, 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 Imerhos. And then you run the credits and I could just have seen that on a, on a scroll, like in a, a, you know, Star Wars or something similar. Brian Smith says, going back to the followers of Sog Mathoth, so they just get slimy and like the dark? That's not so bad. Yeah, I think they kind of lose their lose their brains as well, but you know. All right, cool. 
a couple of things to note here. I mean, I mean, you know, the interesting thing is, it, look, uh, you know, you go on Reddit, you go on Facebook, you go on anything you read, folks, is, uh, hey, oh, I, the new campaign world. You know, what do you think, right? And it's, if we thought we were plowing new ground with our specific campaign worlds, know that this stuff's already been done. <laughs> Yeah, you know, how many how many worlds have we said they begin with something similar? Some great empire, yeah, somewhat modeled at least in 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 you know some ideas on the I, I only Roman Empire. I only say that because after the Roman Empire fell, there was still this title of Holy Roman Emperor that was a thing for a while, for a long while actually, on some level. And there's definitely something similar here. But you know, great empire falls, everyone's fighting, then things kind of calm down. I think the one interesting thing here that we haven't seen yet is things have kind of calmed down to uh, to this. Uh, a natural, almost a stalemate, right? Okay, people are still vying, but everything's kind of reached a calmness. They, the one thing that maybe they haven't mentioned, and maybe it's just the nature of, I think something different that a lot of people would do now is they would have some new threat, right? Now something new is coming. Here, there's nothing, they haven't expressed anything new coming. It's like, here is just as it is, and we've got this status quo. Got the smaller, smaller nations or, or states are kind of doing their own thing and they're hanging out and the larger states are doing their own thing and people learn the lessons of the past and no one's trying to do anything outlandish and this is basically what the world looks like and yeah sure a lot of it's been settled but a lot of it hasn't and so get out there and, and go and and maybe the one thing that people would do now sometimes i think to their detriment not always positively is they would now insert some new menace oh but now the new menace has come right and now but from the dark i could just see someone having added more but from the dark of the sunken landmass that used to be Imarhos Prime or, you know, whatever, something something is bubbling up from the depths, right? To put that, put something, you know, throw this, shake up this this, this globe again and 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 set up. But they haven't they haven't done a hair, so I thought that's an interesting way of doing it. We're essentially starting it even. There are obviously gonna be things happening, but you know, nothing is there's no great, we're not at a cataclysmic or cosmological sort of uh, crossroads. Everything's kind of settled and calm. I thought something else that was interesting was the, it's only mentioned, you know, in passing, right? But this idea of forbidden spells I, it makes me curious. Well, what are the forbidden spells? What kind of forbidden magic was out there? Is that magic different than the magic that's out there now? Are these kind of old spells or are there certain spells on the spell list that are forbidden and, and you have to find them or nobody's teaching them right there? I feel like there's a, Ooh, like, I want to know what, what were the, for, what were the forbidden spells? Uh, so that's really cool. You know, the the oceans, terrible quakes, the oceans swallowing Atlantis. I mean, there's no Atlantis, but, you know, similar kinds of things to that. So all that kind of cataclysmic goodness. As Oval Team Patrol says, D&D &D seems to usually be post-apocalyptic. Yeah. But I mean, the world, I mean, you know, we say that like it's like a D&D &D thing. But if you look at it so often, the world goes through these uh, cataclysmic things, right? The, the Roman Empire falls and we have the Dark Ages. And granted, they weren't as dark maybe as the phrase means, but there certainly was a loss of knowledge and things to the fact that people would look upon stuff that the Romans didn't think like, my gosh, what cyclopses and giants made this stuff. And then there was the, at the end of the, the Bronze Age, there was another, there was a cataclysm then. And, you know, we're, we're all worried as probably we should be about there being a cataclysm now. So we've definitely had these things where we'll take two steps forward or more, and then we take some steps back, and then two steps forward or more, and then we take some steps back. And then, of course, a lot of the fiction, this was based sword and sorcery stuff, seems to be a lot of this same concept of older things. Even pre-Tolkien, I think we, you look at things like Conan, seems to kind of hint at that there were greater things in the past that are, are, are now just the shadows in them around. You're constantly in the ruins of things that are greater than what things are now. Because they were in, you know, a different, I forget what age or however they said it in, in the Conan uh, stories, but sort of a similar type thing. Uh, you can make an argument too, I think in the Fafra and the Grey Mouser kind of stuff that they're going through a world that seems to be a little bit lesser. They're running into ruins and also things that seem to be a lot greater than, than what seems to be in their actual functioning world or in, in, you know, that they're, that they're making now. So this is a, it's something that's been around, I think in a lot of fiction, a lot. Elfbait says, Oh, Hey, Elfbait, by the way, in my campaigns, most of my dungeons are remnants of earlier civilizations. I think they tend to be, I think that's kind of a, a common theme for dungeons is dungeons are 
these things that were something else and usually are interesting and, and, and weird. And, and, and then someone's moved in in the, after those people have gone, something's moved in. They may not understand that stuff, but they just kind of living in it, maybe using it at times, you know, maybe not. Brian Smith says, it's always easier to set everything in the background slash past to allow a GM to pull whatever they want to focus onto the present. I think that's true, too. And plus, part of the whole thing with dungeons is if they were lesser than, like if you're going into something that was not, I mean, you know, then or something that's lesser than kind of what you're in, mean, then it's kind of that factor's loss. I mean, the idea that you're going into something that's mysterious and dangerous because it's greater than you, I think it's just part of that appeal. I mean, there might be something for in the wilderness is just going into new, you know, just new places. But even part of that is kind of like, am I going to run into something that's been here a lot longer than I have and is more powerful or whatnot? I just think it's it's just kind of a draw, I think. It'd be interesting to really, really think through and try a setting that was, had none of that, where you're just, you're in this first push and there isn't anything before you that's better, whether it's the gods or whatever, like, like you are, you are the first people. You're the first people when, when people will talk in their histories about the first people who showed up, you know, you're them. That might be an interesting setting to try. I don't know if it would be, if it would be better or worse than kind of what we, what we tend to do with our settings, but it would certainly be interesting to see it. I'm sure folks have done it, but I haven't really read them yet. Hey, Lonely Adventure afternoon. Glad to see you. Brian Smith says, sending your, seeding your role with possible storylines. Absolutely. All right, so now we're getting into some of the details of this. The geopolitical synopsis. We have the Empire of Thyatis, which we saw earlier. Population, 7 million. Capital, Thyatis. And the language is Thyatic. Thyatis was a major city in the Thang Empire before the Cataclysm. In the Cataclysm's aftermath, it became a rallying point for civilization to rebuild around. Its foundation of power can be traced to 700 years ago when a canal replaced the old caravan route and directly connected Lake Amsorak and the Thasian Sea. Imperial rule in Thyatis is light and loose. The emperor hints at what he wants, and such is his prestige that his hints are the same as law. On a lower level, citizens are expected to pretty much settle their own differences. Guilds and ancient households are virtually independent of the central government. Thyatic law is strict, but seldom applied. The guiding morality of Thyatis is anything is legal as long as you're not caught. Wow. I kind of wonder, could you get to the size of an empire that Thyatis is with such a loose... Uh, and, 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 un, you know, and sort of non-binding, uh, organization. I'm not sure, but they're doing it. Next, we get the Republic of Darakin. Oh, wait a minute. Before I hit that, Elfbate says, it's hard to do. I even created a prehistoric, prehistoric fantasy setting and still ended up with the society that was before. Yes, that, that was kind of part of what I'm saying. It is hard to think about if your guys are coming in first, because one, you know, either everybody's out at the same time. So I guess you could have stuff that's more powerful than you, but they're not older than you. They just have to be more powerful. Like, oh, I'm here and the, so are the saber two tigers. And so are the mastodons and whatnot. And they're, they're bigger than me. But yeah, I, I feel like part of the whole adventure thing is finding stuff that's been lost, even if it's not lost by whole societies before you, but maybe by your society. But there always seems to be an important, it always seems to be an important factor that something that was there isn't there any, and isn't there anymore, and you're trying to get it. I suppose you could replace a lot of that with just searching for raw materials. Hey, we got, you know, gold. We've discovered uses for gold, or, or you know, maybe something be interesting would be meteoric iron, right? You talk about the ancient Egyptians and other peoples that only had access to iron, at least earlier, early in their history, with that from meteors. So tracking down sources of iron for stuff could be adventures in that case. Hey, go find this meteoric iron. And then we could look at, well, what kind of cosmic horror stuff might be also come down with these meteors and what kind of natural things. But at the same time, how long do you do that before you're itching for something and you want to say like, Ooh, maybe there's an old obelisk or something, you know, you know, whatever it just, yeah, it, I think you could do it. I think it'd be an interesting challenge. Maybe we'll have to take up the challenge at some point, but. Yeah, I definitely think it's maybe not as easy as it seems sometimes when people complain that, oh, it's always post-apocalyptic. It's like, yeah, it's true, but you kind of, it's hard to do things when you, without referencing some past, even if it's just the past of your own existing peoples and not some older society. Oh, but it says, especially if you take the Lovecraftian angle where you have things from Eon's past, right? So, you know, what do you do if you're saying you were in Eon 1, basically? 
Now, another thing is, I ran a campaign where humans were setting a new land with no intelligent creatures. It was interesting, but very limiting in what you could do as a GM. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, you could do something where you have just multiple peoples, like imagine a world where the Tower of Babel just happened. And so you're spread along the world and you can no longer comprehend each other. And then you've got all kinds of adventuring things. But it is kind of imposing some limits because you can do that in a, in a normal campaign and you can have all that other stuff. Whereas taking all this stuff away, it feels like a lot of that flavor that you come from is just kind of missing. But again, I think it would be an interesting, interesting challenge. Ryan Smith says, most stories aren't about the first people ever to live on a planet, right? So it's most common to have some elders or marks of them. I mean, I'm sure there are some sci-fi stories that talk about first settlers, but even then I think they're the large part of those first settler stories about where they came from. So it might not be the history of the planet itself, though I think that oftentimes will play a role too. Like, hey, we've, you know, like aliens or alien, maybe, hey, we've landed this planet, seems deserted. Oh, but what? There's a ship out there, a weird ship. And oh, what? There's something inside the weird ship kind of thing. Or it's uh, something where, you know, because there are a lot of stories written about, well, the pangalactic pan spread of humanity. And so you land on planets and things are happening. But even then, there's, there's usually something about it ends up being the past of the people on ship prior to that, all that kind of stuff. And then whether there's something on the planet or not, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. It's been a long time since I've read some of those. I remember I used, used to read a lot of the kind of Greg Bear books. But yeah, I mean, it's it's just, it's different. And in a role-playing game where you may not want to play a lot with internal monologues about people's ancestry and all that stuff, you know, when you're playing kind of an adventure game, then you're really more interested in these external things. Now, those external things might be metaphor for internal things, but we're externalizing them. And how can you externalize a lot of stuff as in stuff that is is there and is mysterious. And why is it mysterious? Because you're not intimately, it's not just, oh, this house that was built 10 years ago. It's no, it's some weird thing that is from people who were alien to me. And I don't know what it was for and all that stuff. And you, to have that, you kind of have to have a past there, but I don't want to act like it's impossible or anything. I'm sure it's been done. I'm sure somebody at some point will point to some games like, oh no, they did that in their setting and it was amazing, but it's definitely, I could see it being challenging. Elfbait says, uh, the ancients trope is so common in, S in sci-fi universes and RPGs. Yes, it is true. <laughs> and then Brian Smith calls this a beautiful tangent we're all skating along. Well, uh, um, yes, it is a good tangent, but let's let's get back to it. I'm sure we'll touch upon it more, and maybe we can do something with that. We could probably have, maybe we can have a brainstorming stream one day where we we pause at what, what, a, game, what, what a game setting we could do that doesn't have the element of ancients or past cultures though the, the first peoples that whatever that silver or golden age when the when humanity first crept out of the ponds or the ships or the pods and and uh wandered the earth brian smith says ask wood about ask ed greenwood about the ancient trope please well if i can you know i i was able to friend him so i i, I can ping him with a message i do want to try to get him on uh, I felt like such a goof because I didn't realize who he was. I know who Ed Greenwood is, but uh, another kind of aside, if you go back and you watch my stream on Fate of the Norns, I asked him, what is your history in gaming? Uh, well, in my defense, I didn't hadn't looked at the side of the stream where he identified himself as Ed Greenwood. And the emails that I'd said, I would going back and forth were uh, were basically like, okay, it's going to be me and Ed are going to be coming on to talk about Fate of the Norns. And I was like, okay, great. You and Ed, I, you know, and, and I was like, all right, that's, that's, that's cool. You know, but he didn't say who Ed was and I hadn't just hadn't delved, delved into it. Cause we'd spent about a month kind of going back and forth off and on with emails. So I, I'm in the space of like, okay. And everything was coming together rather quickly. Cause we were going to do it. Finally got him kind of nailed down on a date. Then they said, oh, no, we can't do it. We got to, uh, there's a, 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 you know, something else has come up. I'm like, okay, fine. And then they're like, oh, we could do it the next day. And so I was like, all right. And then I was like, well, who's who's coming on? And he was like, oh, yeah, me and Ed. Well, okay, you and Ed. Great. So then my normal question I ask, if you've watched a lot of those videos, is sort of, hey, give me your gaming story. So I I hadn't looked down at his little, on on my screen, I get little, uh, little sub windows with different people. And that had his full name on it. But I didn't look at it. It's like, oh, okay, hey, Ed, tell me about your gaming history. And I'm like, as soon as he started talking, I'm like, uh. And then I looked down, I see his name, and I was like, okay, that was a goof. Uh, you know, so it was just, it was a funny thing. But uh, they really enjoyed the talk. Hopefully I'll get them on again to talk about other stuff. And then hopefully I can coax Ed to come on and, yeah, talk about all kinds of things. We'll see. But, yeah, I felt like, uh, I felt like a bit of a goof. 
after that. Brian Smith says, I would have just been Star Trek, starstruck anyway. Thanks for doing that chat. Dude is so entertaining. He is. Yeah, for sure. And I'm again, I think I, what I mentioned to him after the chat was I'm glad I didn't know because I probably would have been fumbling around a bit more as well. And it helped me because I also didn't get too sidetracked. I would have wanted to go like, let's OK, I'm here afraid of the Nords. But let's talk for a half hour or more on Forgotten Realms, past and present. So I'm glad I'm glad that I was kind of. uh just by happenstance, not aware of that until after the fact. But but uh, he did express, uh, when I asked him, hey, would you come on and talk about old school stuff? He he seemed to be uh, open to it. So hopefully I can get him on. T- to be determined. I'll see if I can, see if I can uh, convince him or coax him. Use all my, uh, use all my social skills. I'll, I'll try diplomacy. I'll try persuasion. I may even resort to intimidation to get him get him get him on for something like that ian says the fallen empire is kind of required for default D. where all the dungeons full of treasure come from yes you definitely have to come up with a, a few different mechanisms especially if we're going you know loot for xp if you were going to go with that like i said you could do something uh securing rare minerals could be one uh, there could be things like you have to lean more into being in warfare and things of that nature. You could even, there are some interesting things you could do looking at different cultures, things like, well, what, what do the gods kind of require, right? Because if you're in that generation one, I feel like that's the part where you're closest to the gods and then you're really more in tune with what the gods want and the gods are more active. So maybe you have the gods putting in specific requests, battling against each other, and you're taking more part in that. Stuff like kind of Iliad and Odyssey, Type things, right? The Iliad is just about the war, and of course you could have heroes doing things. If you didn't want to just fight big battles, you could get into all the side stuff, create about that's just in this conflict zone, which all the gods are participating on both sides. You have the Odyssey, which is about, hey, I want to get home, and you accidentally pissed off the god of the, the sea, so he is now making your life super difficult, so you have kind of all adventures there. So different ways to do it, but you, you definitely need to look at mechanically, how are you doing it? Because it's something like if you're playing, hey, this campaign has the Odyssey, the gold isn't your, isn't anything you're concerned about. You're just concerned about getting home. And so you'd want to figure out, well, in this kind of landscape where we don't care at all about gold and we don't care at all about combat either, we care about making progress. Maybe that's how you judge it. However many leagues you sail in a given thing is going to be how, how much experience you get, something of that nature. But yeah, you definitely want to figure it out. Ryan Smith says, replying to Ian, for sure, Delver's got to delve. Absolutely. Yeah, you'd have to figure out, well, what are we, what are we going to do? What's, what the, what, you know, they call it the game loop, which I don't always like a little bit, but, you know, on a meta level, it's, it is useful. You know, what is the game loop like when you're removing gold as a prime motivation? Okay, back to the Republic of Adarokin. 3.6 million. Capital is Darokin, but they also speak Thyatic or their language is Thyatic. Darokin was once an integral part of the Thyatic Empire, but through a series of rebellions became too much of a bother to control and gained its independence. By virtue of all the rivers that run from the... I don't know if that's Ron with three A's. I'm guessing that's like Radon. Or, I saw that somewhere else, like Radon Tepe. By virtue of all the rivers that run from the Radon Tepe Mountains to the city, its main source of revenue is exporting wood from the forest and ore from the mountains upriver. The government is run by elected officials, but personal freedoms mean little. Positions are bought and sold, and the leaders are little more than despots. Justice is swift and often unjust. When in Darokin, it is best to keep a low profile. I feel like they tried to, with that, they kind of tapped into what the, uh, if there was a, a rival state that essentially was sort of the dark side of the coin from Theatis, that feels like that's what kind of Darokin would, Darokin would like, because that one... In Theatis, it seems to be there's some sort of order is it hold, but it's all down to these clans and guilds and things like that. And then it seems like in uh, in Darokin, it's like, what if those things kind of went bad? What if those broke bad? Then what would it look like? I don't know if that's what they thought about when they wrote it up, but it kind of what what seems applicable to me. We get the Kingdom of Sezavi. 2.5 million. Their capital is Sklavik, and they speak Sizavi and Haggith. The kingdom of Sizavi is actually a conglomerate of feudal baronies. The barons are constantly bickering among themselves, but will unite when an outside threat presents itself. The king is chosen by challenge and may be challenged by any baron at any time. Whew. 
Trial by stone! Like the Skeksis. A vast group of feudal serfs are an uncounted part of the population, and from time to time rise in unrest, but have been unsuccessful as yet in throwing off the baronial yoke. Fighting ability is generally the most highly regarded quality in Sezavi. That's good to know. I kind of think that was something that maybe you should do with all of them, is put in this sense of, it's almost like a little bit of, hey, if you're a fighter, maybe you're from Sezavi, because they, they're someone that, you know, you don't have to be, but hey, they favor fighters, so tells you something about them. It might even give you an idea as a player of certain classes where you might want to be from. Brian Smith says, I love hiking and finding some beach. Just a, such a cool feeling in real life. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, it is nothing like finding a spot that it feels like no one else has been there. And of course, there's that bummer when somebody shows up a minute after you, you know, walking their dog. And you just think, oh, okay, well, there go, there goes my little, I thought I had this little private slice of the earth for 10 minutes by myself, and I don't even have it for 30 seconds. Next, we have the Thasian Confederation, a loosely knit group of cities with ports in the Thasian Sea. Risk trade is their common bond, and in times of trouble, their fleets will band together to repulse a common enemy. The members of the Confederation include the Corunglane. Language Glaney or Glaney, the city's principal source of income comes from the offerings given by the vast numbers of people who come to worship the many gods whose main temples are based here. The high priests of each temple form the ruling class. It pays to be pious in Kurung Glane. Well, there you go. Be pious in Kurung Glane. Let's see. And this is, this is Kinidelia or Sinidelia or Sinadesia. Apologies for, I'm sure, terrible pronunciations. Oh, let's see. They speak Thyatic. They're ruled by the powerful rich families who built their fortunes on the broken backs of those who hauled high-grade ore from the mountains 60 miles to the north. Synodicea is, is reminiscent of medieval Venice. That's good. When, when you can, you know, we, we know you want to stay within your fiction, but when you can for someone reading this, if it's a prospective player or if you're writing this for other GMs, when you can give kind of like, hey, this is the analog on Earth, that kind of helps. Because now I have sort of this image in my head a bit for Sinidicea that I, I didn't have before. I mean, sometimes it can be poor, a, 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 the wrong image. So you want to make sure to pick it with care. But I like that. Plotting and throat cutting are the rule rather than the exception. And assassination is a refined art. For an assassin, it is a badge of distinction to have practiced one's trade in Sinidicea. Sharp ears and a clear head are a wise precaution while within this city. And now we get Karamekos. They speak Thyatic. There is only one god in Karamekos, and that is money, is an oft-repeated quote. It is a land of merchant princes who are continually trying to expand their wealth. The wealthiest of these is usually their leader, putting financial pressure on those who stand in his way and in some instances making agreements with those who may be too powerful to subdue. To get anything here, you must buy it. Is it just me or is the, the writing getting a little bit more uh, it, aggressive? Almost where I feel like he's going to put something like, uh-oh, drums in the deep and just trail off. <laughs> I'm writing about this thing and all of a sudden drums, drums in the deep. I don't know. It just It's going into, it's kind of moving from... Maybe it's just me, but I just feel like as it's going on, it's getting more angled. It's got this more of an italic presentation, and it's just speeding me along. Feels like they're writing this before they're about to go to the, you know, they're they're something that you would you would find written uh, right as they're dying of plague, or they're about to go to the guillotine, or the the Inquisition's about to get them, and they're trying to hurriedly get out these last notes before their time has come. Okay, Akoros also speaks, they speak Thyatic. In Akoros or Akoros, there's only one law, and that is, the, is first citizen Akor, or is it Akor? In fact, he has been the law for the last 250 years. No one knows whether he has found the secret of immortality or whether there's been more than one Akor, for no one has ever seen his face. To do so carries with it a sentence of death. Many an intrepid thief or adventurer has gained entrance to the ancient Emerald Palace where he resides only to disappear from the face of the earth. The first citizen's commands are implemented and carried out by the Order of Vicon, his force of elite guards, led by one selected from their ranks, the Vicon of Vicon. The people are oppressed but live in fear of the one who will not die. 
that's pretty cool. And I like there's a, a little bit of a almost an adventure hook there. Oh, you want to try to take your shot and enter the Emerald Palace? Because apparently you can get in. Might not get out again, but you can get in. Selenica and Akasoli, or Axoli, or Axoli. They speak, they used to speak something else, but now they speak Ethesti. Twin capitals of the kingdom of Alasia. These cities have been ruled jointly, although not always peacefully, for the last several hundred years. The current rulers are brother and sister and have coexisted peacefully for several years. However, offering offering offspring on both sides are greedy and grasping, which bodes ill in the future. Brian Smith says, pretty convenient how each city has, there's only one rule in City X. <laughs> Brian Smith says, yeah, not, not much need for lawyers. Exactly. Yeah, there's only one rule. Yeah. Even Fight Club had more rules. We have the Kingdom of Gorlewin, or Gorlewin. I feel like, what, what, is there a way in, does anyone know Welsh? And we have any Welsh speakers in the house? I feel like that double L is to me always makes me think of Welsh. Is there some way I should, we should be pronouncing that Lou, like Lu, Lewin, and I see the kind of Welsh name like Llewellyn. Is that correct? Or is there something else going on there? In any case, we have Gor Lewin, or Lewin. They speak Gwynish, the capital's Glantry. Almost directly in the center of the three most powerful countries, Glantry City would seem to be in a precarious position Except for one thing, the kingdom is ruled by mages and other countries still have an innate fear of magic, which stems from the cataclysm. Left to themselves, their rule is benevolent and wise, and the people are simple but happy. Rumors abound that they are the stewards of a secret knowledge which they guard until such time as the world is ready for it. Some even hint darkly that the knowledge they guard is the same knowledge that caused the cataclysm. ba dum bum bum And then we also get almost a ni another nice adventure hook. And this is Erendi, who speak Yasuli. They are the largest sea power on the continent. The ships of the Erendian fleets range far and wide in search of new trade and treasure. The royal family of Erendi are merely figureheads. The real ruler of the city-state is the captain's council. It isn't wise to wander the docks at night by oneself, because many an unwary citizen or wayfarer has woken with a headache, finding himself conscripted in the Erendian navy. Ah, yes. An age-old tradition. Sooner or later, many Iranian captains get the urge to take their ships into the mysterious Thanagioth archipelago. However, all who have ventured in the mist-shrouded waters have never ventured out again. Again, more uh, adventure hooks this time. Hey, you want to go to the Thanagioth archipelago? Might be tempting, but nobody goes in, nobody goes out. That's right, Lonely Adventures is secret knowledge, eh? Fantasy QAnon, yes. Ancient fantasy secret, huh? Exactly. Minrothad, who also speak Yasuli. Minrothad is a prosperous seaport with an import-export emphasis. The government of Minrothad is a matriarchy. Ascension to the throne is from mother to daughter. The average woman may have three or four husbands in her retinue. Men in Minrothad tend to be rather weak and useless, so women are the crews on their ships. The warrior class are particularly tough and capable and are constantly hoping for a battle to prove their mettle. Men from other countries visit Minrothad, but are careful not to interfere in the natural order of things. The man who attempts to press his attentions on a woman of Minrothad often finds himself a serving eunuch in her household. Ooh, all right, bards be warned. Bards be warned. Right, Smith says, why do they keep going there? Uh, hey, look, what are, you, what are you supposed to do? You're down on your luck. You know, you're, you're, uh, why, why do people do all the things that they do? You think you're not going to be the one, right? I'm not going to be the one to, to, to fall and die screaming and in madness or drown or anything else. I'm, I'm going to be the one to come back with it. Someone's got to do it. Someone's got to be the first one to get in and out. It's going to be me. Emirate of Yalaruam. They also speak Yasuli. Uncontested rulers of the desert, Yalarum caravans, travel to Minrothad and Biazin. I don't know if that's just a flourish on the B or an I, but I'm going to treat it as an I until I see differently. Bringing riches which tempt many an adventurer to seek his fortune. Unfortunately, most fortune hunters lose their way in the vast trackless desert and die of thirst or worse. 
Yeah, well, that happens. And there he is. It is indeed Biazin. They speak Iasuli and Thyatic, and in parentheses, Dwarvish. Situated at the only pass through the Alton Tepe Mountains to the desert, Biazin is ideally placed to benefit from the riches of Yal- Yalarum, or Yalaruam. Bazaars are everywhere, and everyone is trying to hawk something. Dwarves are a large contingent of the population of Biazin, and are craftsmen and dealers in weapons. A good place to make money, sometimes illegally. That's the first time we've seen a, 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 a humanoid or, or demi-human comment on these different uh, uh, geopolitical entities, I guess. I don't know if that is to say that the other ones are completely human or if this is just kind of an even mix of everybody, but there, there's just a really large proportion is dwarven. Unknown. We're now at Dwyrain, who also speak Gwynish. Western frontier, loosely allied with Gorlwyn or Gorlwyn, Main emphasis is the seeking of lands farther west. Their seagoing ships made of wood from the forest are considered the finest open ocean going vessels on the continent. And then we get the Guganics. Language is Plurok and population is unknown. Surrounded on all sides by the Coven Tepe Mountains, Guganics is an isolated city reputed to be a sorcerer's den and a haven for other misbegotten types. Maybe a good spot to be if you were starting a more Murder hoboish campaign is start off in Guganix. Mavrand. Language various. Reputed headquarters of the most successful pirates who plague shipping in the inner sea, the Th- Thasian Confederation has a high has high prices set on all pirate leaders. Nank Rubab. Population varies. I mean, sure, don't they all vary? But I mean, how much does it really vary? It must be a lot. I'm not thinking those other ones stay at that specific number at all times. Language is Zoff. Nankrobab is an independent city on the edge of the Great Swamp, generally regarded with distaste and avoided by the other cities because of the obvious interbreeding of the humans in the city with the quasi-human Malfegi tribe of the swamp. Do I I think I've probably forgotten. Who are the Malfegi? Did we see them in one of the humanoid races? Oh, here we got the orcs, finally. Zodan, or I don't know, S and X together. I'm, I have no idea how what that's supposed to be. So I'm going to just say Zodan. Unknown population, they speak orc. And not much of a note. Only centralized habitation left of what was once the Great Orc Confederation. So the Great Orc Confederation collapsed, but we don't know why. And that's all that's left. Brian Smith says, I just realized I'm basically filling out the same type of details for my four cities in a small region. What aspects these entries share? What are the critical points? I don't know. If I, I, it's a, I mean, it's a good question. I feel like it's good stuff to, to say, to ask yourself for sure. And I would say things I, I look at from here and say, ooh, this is good, right? Is something that's, you know, what's, what's kind of unique or different about these places? The languages is good. Like a population... I could even just have small, medium, large, whatever, and just have some numbers. Or, or if it's easier to put the numbers, that's fine. I like the languages is good. I, I like some bit about them. If there's something interesting, you know, whatever that interesting thing is. If they're, a, if, if it, you know, the one that they're matriarchy, that's certainly interesting and different than everyone else. Or the one where there there is no organization. It's all, or that one where it's the one, right? And kind of what, those kind of, in, those kind of bits, I think, are important. And, and I also like that there's some kind of, uh, I do like the idea of, Hey, here's a, maybe we'll call it an adventure hook. Maybe we'll call it something else, but Hey, you're, Oh, you, you, you want to, you want to hang out with kind of the, the sort of Moss Isley of this place when you're going to want to be over there. Oh, you're, if you're interested in, in deserts and caravans and that one, and, and you want to do kind of, a, I don't want to say Arabian tales kind of stories or that, that's your thing. Okay. We're going to place you, you want to put yourself over here. Oh, you're interested in, 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 uh, Delving in, into the, the the sort of half-sunken ruins of the old world that you can maybe get out to, that's over here. Or you want to help free the slaves, that's over there, right? So you have all these different areas, and they each have, not each of them, because not all of them have it, but I, I think there's enough that have these sort of things of like, okay, what kind of adventures am I looking at if I want to be here? Or, or if I want to place a certain type of adventure, where might I want to put it? So if I want to put a... Hey, do you want to guard, you know, do that old, hey, I'm hiring people to, to guard a caravan. Well, where do the caravans operate? Well, they go across the desert here. Okay, great. I want to hunt pirates. Oh, that's over here. Great. So I appreciate 
those being called out. Now, for reasons we don't know, we don't get that for everything. Like we all we get about the orc place is that it's it's all that's left of the greater orc place. I'd love I'd love to know that to me is I'm almost love to know more about that than some of the other ones. But we don't get it. If I could go back in time and say, hey, could you could you flesh that out a little bit more? Like what happened to the Orc Confederation? What what are they doing over there? What is their what is their society like? Who do they trade with? You know, what's their relations with everybody else? That could would be a lot of fun. Karaptis, Eastern Outpost for the Thyatic Empire, still a frontier town. All right. And we get the Helden clans who speak Helden. A loose-knit confederation of hunting, fishing, sailing peoples, very reminiscent of the Vikings. They will select a leader and band together when the need arises. And I like the, and, and here for this one, it's not really a place, it's more just a people. I, I think calling out that, hey, these are sort of like the Vikings is good, because they're not giving us a lot of other detail. So saying, hey, these are kind of Viking analogs, they're pretty similar to Vikings, means that by just by giving that phrase Vikings, they don't have to give us a whole lot of other stuff. We can kind of think of it in our brains. And then the important thing about them that's maybe a little bit unique, but also going to tell you how they may operate out in the world is leaders are going to rise and they're going to band together under a leader to do things, which you know, gives me enough to kind of uh, to take it from there. And if they have a bigger role and some adventure or something, then we can flesh them out more than the Ethengar clans speak Ethengar they live in the South Plains. These people raise and ride the finest horses on the continent will also band together at need. So maybe they're kind of your Mongol types, maybe. The Minaki clans, who speak Minakan, or Minakian rather, live in the North Plains. These people are reputed to be the best hunters and trackers on the, on the continent. Their skill in archery is legendary. The Dulizmir tribes speak Iasuli, and they're desert tribesmen who often are guides for the Yalaruam caravans. All right, Mike, come on, PDF, what's going on with you now? Oh, PDF. All right, now we have the Nolo Nolo. Set on an inaccessible plateau overlooking a barren plain, Nolo Nolo is a place of mist shrouded mystery. Mist shrouded mysteries. So we don't really don't know anything about that at all. Lindref, Lindref, a small port city, other end of the lake, Amsarak Ferry. So we know there is an, a ferry that goes across the lake. And then this note, there are other points of interest and many unexplored, unexplained areas yet to be found. Adventures abound for the person who seeks it. The continent of Imerhos provides many an opportunity. Well, there you go. So this is that little thing going, oh, and there's other stuff out there. You just got to get out there and find it. And then we're at the end of the document. Ooh, look at that. I think that's the end of all of it. So there was an adventure that was part of this packet. They didn't put it into this documentation because of potential copyrights. I think I mentioned this on an earlier stream, but because it had been submitted to been submitted to TSR at the time and part of that agreement when you're submitting it, I think for a contest or something, is they get copyright of it, you know, they own it. And uh, I, I granted, I don't think Wizards probably would have cared. They probably, I don't even know if they even know this thing exists at all, but maybe they would say, hey, hey, that's ours or whatever. So they didn't post it guys are interested in it let me know in the comments and or in the you know somewhere and i'll put aside um some time for it any last thoughts on what we have seen as we put a wrap on the known world what do you guys think is this a setting that you would play in i think i certainly would i think emir Haas sounds super interesting there's a lot of stuff to like i love the variety in the kind of creatures intelligent creatures that are out there that you could potentially play as could potentially run across the geography is kind of cool this the the world story it's not groundbreaking or anything but it's no better or worse than all the world stories out there and it's, it has a lot of the common themes but that's cool because it's really that stuff doesn't make or break anyway I, I think that in general people put way too much stock in. oh i gotta have some super unique foundational story for my world one they're never as unique or super as people tend to think you are. Oh, like I think like everyone who posts that, but the God has died and some other things trying to now be the new God. It's like, you, you think that you're the first person to come up with it. You haven't, you know? And I, I think often sometimes the simpler stories are easier to get down. They you don't cause as much confusion or run the risk of having as many uh, potential stumbling blocks or things like, well, if the old gods died, then how are we getting healing powers? And now I suddenly got to think about that. And then there's some other thing you got to think about. And you got to think of all these exceptions or otherwise you run into 
you know, what if your grandmother didn't meet your grandmother kind of things. And you can end up spinning around in circles, especially if you don't find that stuff at the beginning. And then they show up in the moment when suddenly someone asks that question and you're just kind of, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And if I answer this question, it could break all the work I've done. So I'm not sure. Uh, and then something like this, it's simple, gives you a nice sense of the place. I think we implicitly, especially now, as we have so much more experience with all these settings, we can kind of find our footing quickly. That's good. Plenty of places to go, I think, in different kinds of adventure spots that were called out. I could do with more, but I think there's certainly enough. You got uh, in, in unknown places to do. If you want to do political stuff, you've got that. If you want to do the, like I said, trade and caravans, you've got that. If you want to be pirates, you've got that. And, or if you just want to interact with them in different ways. So there's a lot of different types of games, types of campaigns you could run in the setting. So yeah, thumbs up for me. I'm just glad this was rediscovered, that it's been digitized and is now shared out there in the world. Walking the Path says, hey, loving the stream, been listening in the background. Great. Glad you're, li glad. thanks for come. Thanks for hanging out and uh, glad you're enjoying the listen. Nothing says, I used to think you needed great game rules. Then I thought you needed a great setting. Now I think you just need great players. Yeah, I think you just need an open mind, you know, because the greatness is really going to come from the intersection of everybody, right? You as a GM, your players, it's not even really great players so much as is it great players for you because great players for one game, one system might not be great players in some other game, some other systems. You really got to find the folks that work well with you. And, and I, I really think that for me, that's why I've really taken on this approach of not trying to super duper control everything as a GM is I think that really pulls the color and the flavor out and leaves you with very narrow paths that your game can go by. Whereas I think that you want to let people just kind of get out there and do and just continually act and react. And so when rules for rules, I end up wanting rules that are flexible enough, easy enough that you can do that and not feel like you're breaking all you're, you're breaking out of everything, or I need to rework all kind of mechanics to get this thing. Cause the party decided to do something off the reservation, which I think is why I OSR and other games that give you a lot of methods for doing rules, but not necessarily a ton of them are good. You'll develop them over time and, and whatnot, but at least they'll all, if you develop them over time, you kind of have it. They will be in a sense, customized for your, for your campaign. And then, yeah, for the settings, it's, it's, it's the backdrop. It's the stuff behind you. You want it to be flavorful, but you know, I don't really like settings or, and this is my thing with backstories too, that you're just in the shadow of it the whole time. Like I want to be out crafting my own story, not fulfilling something that happened behind me that, but that's, but that's me in, in the, it's certainly with a lot of modern gamers have really taken to the creating this journey and half of it's the backstory. And then kind of the fulfillment, the second half of it is the forward story, which is just a different, a different style. But I think if I, if I talk about how gyms can do too much and make their paths of success in the way that we game must flow very narrow, I feel like that ends up being with players too. If I create it where my character only succeeds through a very narrow path, then if it's not going on that path, I start to feel frustrated. I start to feel unfulfilled. And that might be a little bit unfair on the game, unfair on other players, all that stuff. Let's see. Brian Smith said the setting itself was fine. I enjoyed the bit of RPG archaeology. Yeah, it was. It's it's been it's was fun. Brian Smith says loved loved seeing it on notes and patchwork copied sections. Reminds me the game can be whatever you make, just get imaginative. Absolutely, there was <laughs> several different printers. Pr seemed like printing things that were uh, stuck together. We had handwritten notes. Some of it on legal pads. Some of it I'm guessing on white, on on other paper. Yeah, just a whole hodgepodge of stuff in the time when before when most people had access to computers. I mean, they, you know, obviously computers existed at a time, but some of them were the size of small rooms and whatnot, or, you know, and might not have had access to it. And then being able to go in and and just write it down, right? You just need to get it out there, right? When people ask, hey, what, what tool do you need to do this stuff? It's like, you know, you need a pen and paper. Or, you know, you could suppose you could try holding it all in your brain, but pen and paper is good. All right, well, I got to get back to it. Have a great rest of your day, night, whenever you end up watching or listening to this. I should be back tomorrow with something new, which is cool. So, uh, hey, give this a thumbs up on your way out if you don't mind. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Otherwise, have a great, great, you know, next whenever, wherever you are, whenever you are. Enjoy it. Be safe. Be healthy. Game on. Talk to you later.